Some crimes simply capture the nation's heart, and none more so than the disappearance of little Sarah Payne. Sarah vanished three weeks ago while visiting her grandparents' house near Littlehampton in West Sussex. A massive search was launched, and Sarah's parents made a series of emotive appeals on TV. And I don't believe that anyone should be allowed to do that to anybody. The discovery of Sarah's body in a field near Pulborough in West Sussex a week and a half ago confirmed what her family and the police already dreaded. Our own Jeremy Payne is in charge of Sussex CID. Jeremy, I was reading the six o'clock news and doing this story in the headlines almost every day while she was missing, and her parents came on TV night after night after night. How are they coping with this? Fiona, the family have been amazingly courageous. I mean, the pain and heartache that they've gone through is unimaginable. And this is a case which has touched so many people. Sarah was a dear, sweet little girl, and she's been taken from her family in, in dreadful circumstances. Um, and it, it is unbelievable what they've gone through. Uh, the, the, the Sussex police has been completely rocked with this uh, what's happened and particularly the officers who've been involved in the case and there is now a deep and solid determination to find out who killed Sarah. And one of the remarkable things about this case was how it touched a public nerve, didn't it? It did. I mean the response has been unbelievable and if I may on behalf of the family and on behalf of Sussex please thank everybody for all the information and the words of comfort uh, and, 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 and you know with that information we have managed to find out um, some really important things where Sarah was uh, and also we found out some some items of clothing but the, the important thing with this is that this case will be solved through a meticulous and detailed um, investigation and through help from the fa from from uh, members of the public uh, and that continues to come in I mean I'm, I'm not making any specific appeals but if anything um, particularly comes up then of course we'll keep you updated well, let's hope you find that person. Jeremy, thanks very much. Thanks. Fourteen years before little Sarah's abduction, another disappearance gripped the nation. Back in 1986, a 25-year-old estate agent, Susie Lamplew, went missing after setting out to show a house to a potential buyer, a mysterious Mr. Kipper. The Lamplew family have always believed Susie had been murdered, and Susie's mother, Diana, became a tireless campaigner against crime. Now the police have reopened the investigation and, as a result, new witnesses have come forward. With your help tonight, detectives hope to solve this once and for all. Woman estate agent goes missing, police fear for her safety. Susie was last seen alive yesterday lunchtime at this address. Well, we feel that she must have been abducted. The, uh, flats. the River Police joined the search for Susanna Lamp. This is an artist's it's impression of the man Susanna was seen with. Mounted police Neighbors and sniffer dogs were drafted in to aid the painstaking search. Precisely one week on, a young WPC retraced last Susie's last known last. movements. Today, seven years later, the law will formally regard her as dead. For the parents of Susie Lamplew, it was a moment to cherish. News of a fresh investigation into the abduction and murder of their daughter nearly 14 years after she disappeared. As a mother, I feel perhaps much more than everybody else that I very, very much want to know what happened to her, how I could have helped her, how in a way I could almost hold her hand and feel the pain. This is the image of Susie people will remember from 1986. In every photograph issued, her hair has been shown as dark. In fact, on the day she was abducted, she had a very different look. She'd had blonde highlights. Susie um, was the only one in the family who had dark hair. And um, she used to look at all of us and say, I'm dowdy. And of course, she wasn't dowdy because she shone, but she, that wasn't enough for Susie. She wanted to have sparkles in it. And it made, her, it made her look much fairer, particularly because it was sunny at that time. We also now know that Susie wore a hat on the day she disappeared, hugely significant, because it would have made her quite conspicuous. Susie loved wearing hats, and that's why we always have a hat stand in the front of our house. And actually, we've still got one of her hats on it. This is Fulham in West London, where Susie worked and from where she disappeared. On a Monday lunchtime, almost exactly 14 years ago, she set off in a white Ford Fiesta for her appointment in Shorrells Road with Mr. Kipper. Excuse me. Excuse me. This lunchtime, Fergie and Andy fans. Several people noticed Susie outside the house in Shorrells Road. 
and a next door neighbor saw her with a man. A passerby also saw her client and noticed he was carrying a bottle of champagne decorated with a tricolour ribbon. Now new evidence. About a minute's drive from Shorrells Road and just off Fulham Road is Kilverdon Road. A tradesman there had a brush with a car that was very much like Susie's. The argument seemed so fierce he thought the fiesta was going to veer into him. The near miss startled the driver and he watched as the Fiesta indicated right, as though it was about to turn down Fulham Road in the direction of Fulham Palace Road. That near miss happened here, close to Fulham Broadway. Just the other side of Fulham Palace Road, sometime that Monday lunchtime, Susie's car was seen parked up near Fulham Football Club in Stevenage Road. A passerby may actually have seen Susie and possibly her client. It was about lunchtime. I looked over the road and saw a man and a woman walking along the opposite side of Stevenage Road. They were walking away from Fulham Football Club and I noticed them because they were both smartly dressed and the woman was wearing a hat. I thought there might be a wedding somewhere. Susie's hat was later discovered in her car. Maybe she'd been showing Mr Kipper other houses in the district. A few minutes later, I saw the woman on her own in the front garden on Langthorne Street. I couldn't see the man at the time, but it was definitely the same woman. Close to nearby Craven Cottage football ground, a man who'd been waiting for a taxi had seen a couple squabbling. And it must have been quite a row, for he mentioned it to the cabbie. He said that uh, there's a couple having some sort of argument, some kind of um, raised voices. And he felt that uh, whilst he was standing there outside, it rather looked like he was being nosy and ear-wigging in on their arguments. He had a shaggy beard with black curly greying hair, about 40 years old. He kind of resembled what James Galway looked like back then. And I dropped him off in North End Road and that was the last I saw of him. If that could have been you, and you'd now be in your 50s or 60s, please call right away. A few yards away, again in Stevenage Road, something quite disturbing now took place. Well, it was a very hot day, and there was lots of mums about with prams. I was out running in the Bishop's Park, and I came out of the park to be met by a BMW, which tore across the road, come to a halt with uh, somebody with their hand on the ooter, pressing it for a very long time. As I stood there, I saw a blonde young lady. She looked as though she was laughing, or, or she could have been screaming, because the laugh could have been a shouting for help, and it was quite possible that she could have been screaming and, and not laughing. What worried me, you know, how could she drive with, uh, with what was going on? It never occurred to me that it was a left-hand drive car. We never forget the day she disappeared. It is always a difficult day. We try to get right, right away from other people. We really hope that this case might have an end and that Susie might be able to uh, be set free, as my nephew keeps on saying. At the moment, it seems as though she's trapped. Sean, so this whole inquiry seemed trapped for years, but you've made such progress since you reopened it. I'm, let me ask you directly, do you think you know who, who the killer is? It's going to be a matter for the Crown Prosecution Services to whether someone stands trial for a jury to convict or indeed acquit someone of Susie's killing. There's so much energy and new information driving this inquiry forward, hopefully with extra help to, tonight. We, by perhaps towards the end of the year, will hone down on an individual and we hope to be interviewing that individual before the end of the year. Now you say with new in information tonight, specifically what? Certainly around the BMW, anyone who bought or sold or lent a dark left-hand drive, probably BMW, during the first eight months of that year, we think it's a three series, maybe a five, a dark BMW lent to someone that somebody was uncomfortable with or sold to someone. That person we would be very interested in speaking to. The jogger was a remarkable witness and, and was honest enough to say he wasn't sure if she was screaming, he could have been laughing. And of course other people might have thought it was a laugh as well and, and might have seen Susie actually trying to draw attention to herself. 
That vehicle left Stevenage Road, went into Fulham Palace Road, probably with the horn sounding. Other people will have seen that. But then the arterial roads from there, the M4 corridor, the A3 driving round from North London, the M1, that vehicle went elsewhere within the UK later that afternoon or evening. Susie would have got out of that vehicle. Did she try and draw attention to it again? A blonde-haired woman drawing attention, a dark BMW. So Mr Kipper had made the specific arrangement. He was carrying a bottle of champagne. Had he been stalking her? Did, did, he, did he know her, do you think? I think there's every chance he knew Susie, but not necessarily that Susie knew him. That's unclear. Anyone who was an associate or friend of Susie who knew she was seeing someone during that time, an acquaintance or someone who was showing an unhealthy, perhaps, interest in her, should contact us and let us know their concerns. And uh, is this a man who will have confided in anybody or will he have bottled this all up inside himself? This is a man of enormous emotion, in my view, and the view of others. This is a man who will either bragged about what he has done or in times of upset realised the enormity of depriving Susie of her life and confided tearfully. He may have confided to a lover, a friend, a partner or indeed to someone within the criminal fraternity. So if he's bragged or confided, what happens if somebody rings tonight, or indeed the person who wrote a letter to the Daily Mail, and I know you're taking very seriously as well, but, but wrote it anonymously, clearly want to help, worried about getting too much involved. What happens if they ring tonight? Will you divulge their names? Will they get out into the media? We would do all we could to ensure that evidence was bef put before the court and to try and keep that person's anonymity working with, this, with the Crown Prosecution Service. But I can't guarantee that. It would be wrong for me to say so. But what I will say is that person has been so brave in doing what they have done. They need to go that extra step to help the Lamplew family, to help this inquiry and to identify Susie's killer. Sean, thank you. Please uh, call the studio. It's a free call number, 0500 600 600. If there's anything at all you think you can add to what Mr Sawyer has been saying, or you can ring the incident room now, 020 7321 9251. Last month, we appealed for a man wanted in connection with an unprovoked racial attack in London's Camden Town. The same night, a man contacted police and has been bailed while inquiries continue. A nail bomber, David Copeland, has been given six life sentences for causing explosions in London's Brixton, Brick Lane and Soho in April last year. It was CCTV footage shown on television, though not on Crime Watch, which led directly to Copeland's identification and arrest. Next, a home video which will bring tears to the eyes of a couple of thieves. They've just ram-raided a mobile phone shop in the Shepherd's Bush area of London in the early hours of a Monday morning. One stands lookout while the other steals everything he can. What they don't know is they've woken a neighbour who's filming the action, wiping never-to-be-repeated moments from his daughter's birthday in the process. Let's make his sacrifice worthwhile. Tell us who they are. Ring 020 8246 2657. And here's another face we want to put a name to. A man dressed in denims has raided five banks and building societies in Staffordshire and Nottinghamshire over the last couple of years. Now he's five foot ten, heavily built, and wears the same blue jeans with a denim jacket and a blue cotton cap. If you know our denim bank robber, call 01785 234 961. For women, the biggest danger of being attacked is from people we know. But for most of us, our worst fear is walking at night down a deserted street when you hear footsteps and suddenly a stranger jumps out at you. Luckily, it happens very rarely. But when it does, I don't need to tell you, the effect on the victims is devastating. My friends were always telling me, you know, don't walk home alone. It's a very stupid thing to do, especially in Camden. But being able to walk alone and having the confidence to do that is extremely important to me. And now it's like I can't do that anymore. Thanks for that, it was brilliant. I'll see you later. Yeah. Call okay. you tomorrow. Bye. I was walking home one night from watching a band play, um, about five minutes from where I live. I noticed somebody walking towards me on the other side of the road. I thought at the time that there's absolutely no way I'm going to let this bloke rape me. What's going on? Are you all right, love? He's just trying to rape me. 
me. Right, come on. I'll call the police. No. No, I'll do it myself. I just want to go home. But let me walk you home. Die, I've just got to walk her home. She's, she's been attacked. Come on. A couple of hours later, and only yards from the first attack, a student set off home after visiting a friend. I was walking down St Pancras away. I was listening to my stereo, so I didn't hear anything. I've got a knife in my back pocket and I'll use it. Don't make a fuss and you won't get hurt. Get up. Don't make any sudden moves. I'll stab you, you know. Well, he was holding me extremely firmly. He was very strong, very much stronger than me. And he walked me back up St Pancras Way. Have you got a mobile? <laughs> yeah. Move or you'll get hurt. But don't say anything. He crossed the road at one point, I think because there were some people coming the opposite direction. I can't remember any age or sex, but one of them may have had a walking stick. When we were walking up the road, it could easily have looked like we were boyfriend and girlfriend. He had one arm around my shoulder and the other arm holding my arm. We went down, um, down the side of the bridge, so we were at the canal, and that's when I started really fighting with him. We had a big fight down there. <laughs> I bit him on his right arm. I assume it was hard enough to leave a mark, at least a temporary bruising, before I think I eventually gave in, didn't have enough energy in me anymore. He raped her, and afterwards... Open it. How much money you got? About five, huh? Well, give it to me. How much does this cost? Not much, about 50 quid. Sit on a bench. Turn around and look the other way. A little while later, a man resembling the rapist was seen standing on Camden Road. He may have been wearing a USA sweatshirt. Did you see him? The next night, a woman was returning home after visiting friends in the area of the first attack. When I got onto Kentish Town Road, I was surprised that there weren't any taxis, and I was looking for one, but I didn't want to hang around at that time. So I thought the best thing to do was to keep on walking. As I turned into Walden Road, I saw on the opposite side of the road above the phone box this man, the back of a man, like as if somebody had just appeared out of nowhere. And at that point, I really, really got scared. It was almost as if there was a signal coming off him, although it was his back to me that I saw. I just got this very strong instinct to get away from this man. What is it you want? <laughs> What's going on? Please, can you help me? Are you okay? What happened? Let's get you into the car. I consider myself to be incredibly fortunate because I was actually rescued. I hadn't any idea of the enormity of the effect on the individual person, because I've always been comparatively fearless in my life, and it turned me into somebody I didn't know, and I will get over it, but I do hope he's found, and that he has given some help, because he really needs it. Mark, that's a terrible ordeal for those women. What do we know about what the rapist looked like, first of all? Well, this guy is black. He's quite short, anything between five foot six and five foot ten inches tall. He's slim, and um, he's been described as quite powerful as well. And what about what he was wearing? Was there anything distinctive about what he was wearing? Yes, on the second attack, he was wearing a, a sweatshirt, which uh, is a navy sweatshirt and has a USA logo on the, on well, the so front. Well, that's very of it. distinctive, so someone might recognise that. Very distinctive, yes. Um, 
also he's wearing a, a blue baseball cap or dark coloured baseball cap and um, clear lens glasses which he may have been used as a as this, this sort of disguise. So they weren't prescription glasses you don't think? That's you right. think they were just, just That's pretend right. effectively? Yes. Now when this happened it was the May Day bank holiday. Mm. Now just to jog people's memories that was the bank holiday when all those anti-capitalist rioters descended on Parliament Square and they tore up the grass and they put grass on Winston That's Churchill right. statue and what That's have right. you. Is it Anything that anyone who knows this man might have noticed about him out of the ordinary that bank holiday? Yeah, these attacks were, were committed very late at night, so they'd come home late. Um, on the first night it was raining, continuously raining, so it had been soaking through. He had no protective clothing at all, so it had been very wet. He also may have had some sort of bruising or a bite mark on his arm, just above his right wrist. And presumably in a very agitated state. Yes, I mean, obviously just committed these offences, he would have been very agitated, yes. Now, we saw in the film there that there, there may be two potential witnesses. What do you know about them? Yes, on the second attack, we have um, a couple that walk through the scene. Um, the victim describes one of them wearing a walking aid, so possibly they may be elderly, but we'd like them to come forward. They may have seen something. OK, well, you may be this man's wife, his ex-wife, a partner, you may be his mother. The police do have forensic evidence, so they can rule out anyone uh, who isn't the culprit. Let's find this culprit, whoever he is. If you've any idea, ring us in the studio or call the incident room on 020 8733 4361. And remember, if you've been a victim of any crime and you'd like to talk to someone, you can call Victim Support Line on 0845 30 30 900. There'll be volunteers waiting for your call until 2 o'clock this morning. Flashback to last year. A jeweller's in Salisbury, Wiltshire, did some good business with this customer. The man with the short sleeve shirt splashed out over £500 on a gold bracelet, but the credit card he used wasn't his. It had been stolen from someone's car and used in a shopping spree. That included hundreds of pounds worth of Spanish pesetas. Maybe he was planning a holiday. Was he staying at your hotel last summer? And where is he right now? That's the short sleeve fraudster. Call 0500 600 600 or 01722. 411 Now I'm keen to round up members of a fraud ring and this woman could be a key witness. Now she paid in a cheque for over £50,000 at Lloyds Bank in Stratford, East London. In fact it had been stolen and someone had changed the name of the payee. And she's around 5 foot 4 and if she'll forgive us for saying so, rather on the plump side. Now that's our stolen cheque lady, ring 01 442 I'm just trying to, to catch up with some of the calls that are coming in at the moment on, on Sarah Payne. A lot of calls, but most of them, to be honest, are fairly general. On the Susie Lamplew case, we wanted perhaps half a dozen calls, particularly focused ones. In fact, so far we've probably had 30 or 40, maybe even more by now. A lot of them quite general, but people really trying to help. Um, on the BMW, for example, people have pointed out the M3 model was left-hand drive, but we know that came out later. In fact, quite a lot of the information, including on two particular individuals, which looked very good at first, I've just checked with the officers, I think they know that information already. But there's a lot more coming in, and I'll try and bring you some more details as we go on. Fiona. Now, who ran down Paul Bowden and left him dead in the middle of the road? His body was found in the early hours a month ago at Woodrow near Amersham in Buckinghamshire. Paul, who was 20, had been out to his sister's engagement party. He then went on to the Orchard nightclub in Hazelmere and was last seen walking home at about quarter past three in the morning along the A404. He died of severe head injuries. There was engine grease on his face and he had superficial injuries to his chest. Now, Jake, Paul was your son. I know it's an ordeal for you coming in here. Thank you for coming in. Now, most fathers would like to think that they're close to their sons, but you were very, very close to Paul, weren't you? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, I, I, he was my best man two years ago when we got married, and the fact that we chose him to do that probably speaks volumes of the kind of boy he was. Um, I mean, he was a boy who grew into a lovely young man, and uh, naturally the whole family, uh, you know, we're just totally devastated by what's happened. Um, not just a close family, but you know, other relatives and anyone else who knew him. I mean, he was he was just a very kind, caring, loving boy. When I spoke to you earlier, you said he was rather like a son. He was more like a brother to you. That's right. I mean, well, his mother died uh, uh, about ten years ago, and uh, you know, naturally that formed a close bond between all the family. And uh, Paul, being the oldest son, you know. Uh, I guess I lent on him, you know, on him a little bit at times. 
And he was a great support team. Oh, well, definitely, yes. Yeah. Now, we need to find whoever it was that did this. Is it possible that whoever did hit Paul, maybe they just didn't realise? It is a possibility. It's a dark stretch of road in a rural area. Paul was wearing dark clothing. It is possible that uh, the driver of the car involved may have thought they'd hit something else in the road. Um, the person, after the publicity given to this case in the area now, um, knows that that is not the case. He knows that there has been a death caused and I want that person to come forward now. And of course, there may have been a passenger in the car as well. What do we know about the car itself? We know from the paint found at the scene and on Paul's body that it's a dark blue metallic paint. I've got this example here. The paint has been analysed and it's been compared to Vauxhall's Polar Sea Blue, Ford's State Blue or Mercedes Azurite Blue. It is very similar to those colours and I would ask that any motor trader, anybody in the motor trade, that has carried out any resprays, repairs or provided any spare parts on, a, on such a vehicle to come forward. Okay. We are looking for damage caused to the front or rear bumper or valance on the offending vehicle. OK, well, let's see what we can get. Please call us if you've an idea who is responsible. 0500 600 600 or the incident room on 01494 736 707. Police in Hampshire are investigating a series of sex attacks on women and girls, the youngest of whom was just 11. It's been happening in the Hailing Island and Havant areas of Hampshire. The attacker wears a variety of disguises, including this Dracula mask, and we need to find out where it comes from. Now, on one occasion, he also used this large-sized pair of ladies' knickers to tie up his victim. They're quite distinctive, labelled Grenit Lingerie. Do you recognise them? And can you recognise him? The victim of the most recent incident has put together an impression. He's smallish at five foot seven, with short greying or brown hair, slim, and he seems physically weak. When victims put up a struggle, he can't cope and just runs off. Now, it's really urgent we find him. Please ring 023 9289 1999. Now, I'm looking for two men wanted for indecent assaults on children. Now, the first is Gary Erskine, charged with rape and due to appear at Dartford Crown Court in November last year, and he failed to turn up. Now, he's 41, 5 foot 8, and has a South African accent. Call 01474 585 133. And Graham Nettleton. He's been on the run for seven years since he missed his court appearance back in 1993. He's 5 foot 10 and he's now 39 years old and he has a distinctive tattoo on his right shoulder listing the names of his children. 01423 539 485. And a teacher who's gone missing along with one of his pupils. Have you seen Paul Tramontini, who taught maths at a school in Portsmouth? He and a 15-year-old girl have been missing for three months. Now, a lot of people are obviously frantic with worry. Please call if you've seen them. 0500 600 600 here to the studio or 023 9289 9058. In June last year, we appealed about a gang responsible for breaking into homes in the northwest of England. Families were tied up and property, mainly jewellery, was stolen. As a result of tip-offs, Robert Thompson and Carlos Graham have been sentenced to a total of 21 years. Stephen Salisbury is also now in prison. He's serving life after being found guilty of murdering Wendy Upton. Wendy was the subject of a Crime Watch appeal after going missing in October 1998. Though contrary to a press report, Wendy's killer was never used in a Crime Watch reconstruction. The East End of London used to be notorious for gangs like the Cray Twins. It's got very much upmarket since then, but there are still throwbacks. And two months ago, on the north side of the now redeveloped Royal Victoria Dock, several suspicious looking characters seemed rather out of place. My first and immediate reaction was that that looks like a drug deal that's going down. An elderly white man in his 50s, he was wearing a long leather coat and walked with a pronounced limp. He struck me as being your typical East End villain. Three more witnesses saw something that looked very odd indeed. A white jeep was removing a barrier that stopped cars driving along the dock. Not on that side, 
road traffic accident. Everything suddenly started to go in slow motion. As I pulled up, I saw these guys, just I thought it was a film set. And then in a couple of seconds, I realized it wasn't. You know, this was really going off. Um, my two passengers by now were shouting out to me, don't stop, carry on, don't be a hero. There was the one guy standing on the middle uh, section with the gun, but the thing that surprised me was how quiet they were. And, and they, didn't even, they didn't even stop to look at me. In fact, the gang seemed quite unfazed by passing traffic. One man with a shotgun even waved cars through. Up. I could see it was coming towards me. Probably going a bit fast than it should have been. I had to get out of the way. It was either that or get hit. One guy I particularly noticed, his hair was sort of wispy at the front and at the sides. He was wearing glasses as well. There were a lot of vehicles used in that raid, five and maybe seven. The Silver Range Rover bought in March in Romford, Essex. The white Sherpa with old LEB markings bought at auction in Chelmsford. The white Jeep, at least it had Jeep written on it, but white ones are very rare. The Subaru pickup, which had been stored for months, a new battery, but cobwebs in the cab. The switch vehicles, a blue van, and where's that Vauxhall Vectra N325 PNJ? and there was also a green or blue Bentley seen in the area before the raid. There is a large reward if you can link those vehicles with the gang and help get some dangerous crooks into court. 0500 600 600 or you can ring the incident room on 020 7230 2061. And you can even claim the reward anonymously if you ring Crime Stoppers 0800 555 trouble one. Can I just say on the Susie Lamplu case we're getting lots of people not with specific information generally trying to help but please unless you've got specific information don't jam the lines particularly don't tell us about Mr Kipper. A lot of people have got all sorts of assertions about who he is whether it's a Dutch name and so forth and more general stuff about the BMW. It's specific leads that we're looking for please. Jeremy. What kind of low life would target a 90-year-old lady who's partially blind and suffering from dementia? Now, in July last year, £400 was taken by men who claimed to be friends of a gardener. Now, Basingstoke Stoke Police then managed to catch a team of con men on video by hiding these cameras in the lady's home. Two men came to call and left with money, so who are they? And in December, two apparently different men wearing distinctive yellow jackets pulled a similar trick. Now, let's have their names. The lady concerned has sadly died. But let's stop this lot calling on any more frail old people. Call 01256 405 017. Next, a man who's been visiting shops and pubs in North London pretending to be a heating or air conditioning engineer. He gains the trust of staff by hanging around the premises, sometimes for a few days, apparently busy with a job. Then he steals money from the safe. Up until now, he's got away with tens of thousands of pounds. He's in his 40s, stocky, quite rugged looking with a Cockney accent. Sometimes he's accompanied by a very skinny 18-year-old lad with dark, spiky hair, also with a Cockney accent. If you know either of them, please call us 020 7421 0323. Next, a robbery. The thieves left empty-handed, but they destroyed a family. Val and Ray Hannah had been running their frozen food business together for the last 20 years. We just did everything together for 36 years, 37 years. What we really wanted to do was renew our marriage vows on our wedding anniversary, which is the October the 5th. There wasn't a night of our lives 
we didn't tell each other we loved each other. Ray and I arrived at the premises about lunchtime on that particular day, and it was quiet because the drivers had gone out. We were trying to get together for the accountant while the sales invoices. Have you seen the invoices for me? I don't know where the boys have left them. <laughs> no idea, love. You look in the cabinet, I'll check the files. Hey, they're going to be in the last place we look, aren't they? <laughs> we hadn't been in five or ten minutes, and we heard voices come again. I was transfixed by this knife, but it was so shiny. It's safe! <laughs> they didn't even try and open the safe. They didn't touch it. They got nothing. So it was all for nothing. Get out of here! The police are on the way! I now know the difference between being frightened and blind terror. And that was blind terror. Fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Look, you press the panic button. I'm going to see if I can see them. Right. Are you okay? Yeah. Where'd they go? Uh, they just sped up in a blue car, uh, a V715. Uh, one of them had a big knife. Have they stolen anything? No, 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 I stopped them. Right, you stop here. There's an officer seconds behind me. I'm just going to have a look around the area. Okay? Right. Later in the day, the car used by the raiders was dumped a quarter of a mile away on the Tongbarn estate. And within minutes of the raid, just yards from there... I was coming down Oxford Road towards School Lane, saw three lads running across the main road. I was amazed because they were running so fast, they never looked. He just ran straight across the road towards Cambridge Road. Seconds later, the same witness had another sighting. Saw what appeared to be the same three lads running across the top of Ash Grove. And that was the last I saw of them. And they threatened me with a huge knife and demanded the safe keys. Right, and what happened next? Well, we struggled. I got one of them in a headlock. But he, he trotted his knife in my ribs. I, I thought I was going to be stabbed, so I let go of him. Get out of here! And then... Apparently he collapsed. I, I saw, saw an ambulance. I shot outside to see what was going on. And I saw them trying to resuscitate him. It's a picture I'll take with me to my grave. It's something you see on casualty or ER or when it's your husband. Like, I just can't describe the feeling of helplessness and horror. We followed the ambulance to Omskirk Hospital. But I was just hysterical because it was only then when we got to the hospital and we were shown to this relative's room, which is everybody's worst nightmare. The pathologist has said that um, only for the trauma of what happened that day, Ray would be here today. I'm still at the, at the stage of getting two mugs out of the kitchen cupboard to make two cups of tea in the morning. It's destroyed my life. Just so so pointless, and they didn't even get any money. Just so pointless. Yeah, all that, and the thieves got away with nothing. Now, are we talking about two robbers or three robbers? Well, we have one sighting of two men, another of three men. What we do know is that when the Citroen Saxo was found, the driver's seat had been lifted forward suggesting that somebody's had to get out of the back seat, so we think there were probably the three men involved altogether. And have we got a description of any of them? We've got an e-fit of one, which we think is a particularly good likeness. He's described as being in his early 20s to late 30s, of average build, with um, very short, dark, cropped hair, and he was wearing a denim jacket, blue jeans and trainers. So anyone who recognises that description, call in. And also we're interested in sightings of the car, this blue Citroen. It was stolen from Liverpool on the 20th of June, and then the robbery was on the 22nd, so it's, it's anything in between those two dates, isn't it? That's right. We have some sightings of it in Skelmersdale the evening before the attack, but where's it been all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday? That's what we need to know. Now, there are also some things in the car. We've got replicas of these. First of all, there was, there was a key ring like this in the car. Now, how, what's this? That's a cartoon character. It's a Tasmanian devil. 
and we also have on there um, the, the typical Guinness emblem. And, and that key there with the, the purple fob, that's particularly distinctive. And I'd dearly love to know where those keys are now. So, of course, they might be separated now, but anyone who, who recognises these. And then this, I've never seen one of these, but something like... Or, or this is a, a copy of it, but it's something exactly like this was in the car as well, wasn't it? That's right. That's a chucky. You throw it at walls and it laughs at you. Now, those were quite popular and sold in, in lots, in vast numbers, until about March, but they haven't been sold since then. So if anybody's been given one in the past few weeks, we'd like to hear from them too. Could be child, girlfriend, perhaps. Exactly. Now, what about the knife that we saw terrifying, a very long blade? Mrs Hannah, Valerie, thinks it was at least ten inches long, and what sticks in her mind, she recalls thinking the blade was that shiny she could have used it to put a lipstick on. So we think it's probably not a kitchen knife, maybe a martial arts knife or a ceremonial knife, something along those lines. OK, again, very distinctive. And there's a substantial reward, we should say. So, OK, if you know anything or you've heard anything, call 0500 600 600 or 01695 566 566. So many calls so far on Susie Lampley. Let me start by giving some feedback on that. I asked for specific calls and now we're getting them. We've had five names mentioned plus one name that's come up five times and these are from people who are really giving us particular information. Um, on the Ram Raid, the home video there, we've got a very strong lead indeed. On the Camden Rapes, uh, two names, also three women have rung in and they think that they have been attacked by the same man. On the Hit and Run, We've got some very powerful information that's coming in. Um, that's going to be checked out tonight and probably we won't know more about that until tomorrow or perhaps even the next day. On the Denim Bank robbers, uh, Robber, four names. Uh, one in particular is interesting because of some uh, additional information that's come in on that. Now, I mean, there really is information coming in so fast at the moment, it's impossible to, to get through uh, more details to you. Can I just say it's specific and focused information, please, on the big appeals we're looking for, and not just hunches. Fiona. Keep those calls coming in. These are all crimes that can be solved with your help tonight. And the lines here are open until midnight. Our numbers are on CFAX, page 621. You can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. And remember, if you've been a victim of any crime and you'd like to talk to someone, you can call Victim Support Line on 0845 30 30 900. There'll be volunteers waiting for your call until 2 in the morning. Join us for Crime Watch Update in 40 minutes. And if that's past your bedtime, well, join us for a special edition of Crime Watch next month. That's Wednesday, August the 23rd. We'll, we'll be showing how calls have led to convictions in five high-profile cases. So, unless you're one of the people that we're trying to find tonight, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.